805. All right, uh, thanks everyone and uh, for taking your time to join us and to listen to this uh, nice, interesting talk, and uh, which is a continuation from um, a series of talks that we've had here organized by uh, the kind folks at uh, Links. This webinar is on uh, hard, uh, an introduction to hard X-ray coherent diffractive imaging in BRAC geometry. So in the the previous talks, we've uh, we've seen a little, we've heard and seen how um, techniques such as uh, tychography is uh, extremely useful. And in the forward uh, scattering regime, you you can study extended samples, samples that are ideally extended uh, larger than, than the beam size, and you could raster to this sample and uh, the overlapping information gives you uh, a lot of constraint to see some features. And now what we're gonna look right now is how we could uh, use a uh, phase retrieval in some sort of a, an inverse uh, problem scenario to, to reconstruct from, uh, from, uh, from measured diffraction patterns in, in Bragg scattering uh, geometry to show things such as strain within crystals and uh, atomic displacement and most of these things also could be uh, done in situ. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dimitri uh, Jigev. Um, Dima is a very uh, exciting and interesting uh, young scientist. I've uh, known him uh, personally for about two, getting to two, three years now, but I've known, I've been following his work for the past six, seven years. He got his uh, PhD in uh, 2017 from the University of uh, Hamburg. And um, his work with people like uh, Ivan Vatanians and uh, um, Eckhart, Edgar, and all those uh, very, very uh, famous folks in synchrotron and photon science who can actually help us build uh, young people like us today to not just take over, but to control the direction of uh, synchrotron radiation research. Uh, Dimitri is currently a postdoctoral um, researcher in the uh, uh, division of uh, synchrotron radiation research within the Department of Physics at uh, Lund uh, University. And uh, he has uh, over nine years of experience uh, working with uh, synchrotron and uh, physics and materials uh, related uh, problem. So I would like to give a nice welcome to, to, to Dimitri, I call him Dima. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the floor is all yours and, uh, and hey. uh, please, yeah, please go ahead, yeah. Thanks, Ed, for a really nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, really nice to see so many people today. And I really hope that uh, a lot of these people are still following from the previous talks, because this is, as uh, was told, the continuation of the, uh, the whole series of webinars. And today we're going to talk about the applications of coherent diffractive imaging in, uh, in Bragg geometry. Um, since uh, we already have uh, some knowledge about the coherent diffractive imaging, we'll just refresh what we already know from the previous webinars. Then why uh, we should do the imaging in the Bragg geometry at all, how we measure that or how we obtain the data, what kind of information and especially quantitative information we can obtain, what are the limited, what are the limitations and challenges you can face uh, during uh, using this technique um, and what are the technical implementations and facilities around the world to do that. And hopefully that will be a new part on this webinar. We will have some hands-on experience if it goes well, I hope so. So let's start. Um, just a recap um, of the coherent diffraction, diffraction imaging. What we use, we normally use a coherent uh, X-ray beams produced by synchrotrons or free electron lasers also um, to illuminate uh, structures like uh, extended objects or com uh, compact objects and with uh, certain assumptions like uh, far field regime when uh, the object is uh, relatively small and we measure the diffraction from the long distance, we can record diffraction patterns having these nice oscillations coming from the shape or from the internal structure of the object, and we measure the intensities of, uh, of this scattering. And uh, it can be in the scanning way, like topography, or it can be an isolated object, so we can reconstruct it in, in 3D using tomographic approaches. 
we face uh, we face the face problem, which is kind of funny. So we need to reconstruct the original complex valued uh, uh, object function, which contains the information about the material uh, by applying residual algorithms that was explained in the previous talks. Uh, by reconstructing this uh, function, which is in case uh, the complex valued density or electric density, we can uh, access the absorption contrast through the object or the phase contrast for weakly scattering objects. So that's all nice and we can reconstruct it for any point in our object in 3D. But what happens if we replace our general object with a crystal? which has an order to the placement of atoms. Um, and if we shine, shine X-rays onto the crystal, it was well discovered uh, 100 years ago that we get uh, uh, a special spots on the, on the detector behind, which called black peaks. And the information contained through these black peaks uh, allows us uh, to reconstruct uh, the actual atomic structure of the crystal. That goes through the Bragg's law. Uh, the Bragg's law is a very simple uh, connection between the spacing D uh, between the atoms or uh, atomic planes and the uh, incidence angle of the X-rays to, uh, to this crystal and the wavelengths. So the constructive interference which is forming the Bragg peaks uh, uh, occurs only at those places where we are aligned with a reciprocal lattice vector positions uh, from our crystal. This is the simple uh, drawing showing how the experiment actually goes. Uh, in another way, we can describe the diffraction from the crystal by constructing the so-called Evold sphere, uh, which is based on two vectors, Ki, which is incident wave vector, the modulus of it is 2 pi divided by the wavelength, and Kf is a scattering vector separated by two theta bracks, so that's the break angle for a given crystal. Uh, taking the difference between Kf and Ki, we can construct the Q vector or the Q space of uh, wave transfer vectors. And by choosing the certain orientation, the position of this, the end of this Q vector aligns with the position of the H vector for the certain crystal or reciprocal lattice. Uh, and in this case, we can record uh, the Bragg reflection. Um, the bandwidth is basically shown the, by the thickness of the evil sphere, so the bandwidth of your radiation gives some width, so you record some area around the break peak on your detector. So this is the basics how, how we're going to treat the diffraction. Um, just a brief recap on the coherence. So if we now take the object uh, and, put, uh, and make it sufficiently small, and it's a crystalline object, and uh, we put it into so-called coherence volume, which is defined by the source parameters of the synchrotron, let's say. Um, in, the, in this case, the longitudinal coherence defined uh, through the monochromaticity, monochromaticity of the uh, radiation. And for third generation synchrotrons, it's a value around one micrometer. And the transverse coherence length is defined by how far we are from the source and how small is the source D. And by putting the, um, the object into this coherence volume, so we illuminate completely our object with a coherent beam, we can produce the coherent diffraction pattern, which in case of the cubic structure will look like that. So what is happening basically, we zoom in into the one of those break peaks if we go to the Bragg geometry, so we can. So if we record the three-dimensional uh, intensity distribution around the Bragg point, you will see something like that, and they all look similar, but they have a different sensitivity. And sensitivity they have is the sensitivity to the displacements of atoms from their equilibrium positions. Uh, in this scheme, it's shown by the uh, vector U, which is called displacement field, and if you shine your X-rays on a place where the atoms are displaced from the original positions, you get a distortions in your diffraction pattern in one or another way. And by writing up, again, in kinematical uh, approximation, the far-field scattering amplitude, we can see that in the case of the Bragg scattering, we start to be sensitive to, to the deformations inside the crystal, 
which are located in the face of the complex valued uh, object function. The S here is the shape of the object since it's smaller than the coherence volume, it describes the morphology, and the face is basically now our, our new deformation. By reconstructing the face of the object, we can extract the displacement field, so how atoms are displaced from their position. Um, by measuring a certain uh, HKL reflection, because crystal has different uh, uh, reflections, uh, we access only a projection on to this uh, direction. So, since so strain crystal structure, uh, which can look like that, uh, the, the strain can be compressive or tensile, so this deformation describes how the structure actually looks like. By shining X-rays on this type of structure, we can get different effects from the simple point of view. If the crystal is unstrained, we get just original peak position, which can be found uh, from crystallographic um, techniques uh, in the literature. If uh, there is a homogeneous strain inside the, the structure, the peak will just shift in the queue space, showing either atoms get closer or further apart. Or if you have an homogeneous strain to, due to whatever reasons, uh, the peak start to broaden or change its shape and it can become asymmetric. And this is the, the most interesting part that we can actually look into this inhomogeneity of the crystalline structure caused by lots of different eff uh, effects. Some examples uh, on a very simple numerical models. If you take, uh, as it was probably already shown, the plane object with amplitude one around our zeros and no phase, so basically no distortions, you can get a nice diffraction pattern which looks like a sinc function in any, any dimension, squared sinc function, so this is the intensity. Uh, however, if uh, you focus on some uh, elastic strain, for example in um, semiconductor materials when you have a mismatch between two uh, uh, structures uh, which are uh, got uh, close together, there is a misfit strain that appears at the interface of these two structures trying to accommodate the lattice constants of each of them. Then you get profiles something like that. So the face has certain curvature uh, which is uh, not linear. And in this case, you shine the X-rays and you see the asymmetric behavior of the scattering diffraction pattern um, in one direction. So this is like a plane. Uh, X, Y, you can see it here, but in other direction it still stays the same. So are we very sensitive to the direction or the magnitude of this effect? Or there could be other defects like point defects, some topological defects like uh, dislocations, which can be simulated like vortex fields inside uh, the phase. So basically there are points of zero intensity and the phase is not defined there. So it goes to 2 pi, uh, values around this point forming such vortices and this is how the dislocation looks like in the crystal if you reconstruct the face from the phase retrieval and the diffraction starts to split and all kind of interesting effects uh, can appear. It also applies to planar defects or stacking faults. The diffraction patterns start to have these um, certain features and they all can intermix so the final diffraction pattern can look very complicated like this one for example under the external stimuli this is experimental data. If you take your crystal and shine the green X-rays, you see a nice fringy pattern showing a perfect symmetry. But if you start to plastically deform it, the diffraction pattern is totally away from what is was initial. And this is actually a current challenge to reconstruct um, this type of data. So a short summary uh, about this part, what we are actually sensitive to with the BRAC approach, we can reconstruct still the morphology, the lattice spacing, if you have some absolute reference for your uh, measurements, elastic strains, you can image uh, the effects from defects and also the dynamics of the defects formation inside the localized crystals, some defects like tweeting or multiphase coexistence or surface induced stress or polarization driven atomic displacements. All these um, uh, effects affecting basically the atomic displacement inside the crystallized structure can be studied. And it's a really wide and developing field of science. Um, 
Moving forward, so that's all fine. We can get all this nice information, but how we actually obtain the data? If we continue um, the discussion in terms of uh, k-vectors, uh, how to record uh, the full three-dimensional um, information around the breakpoints um, in the actual experiment. Uh, in case of the forward scattering, you just rotate your sample and you, you get slices through the center of the diffraction pattern and then you can stack them in 3D. But in the case of Breck CDI, Breck Human Diffractive Imaging, you have to place your object into the center of rotation of the device, which can re uh, reliably record uh, the scattering. And uh, here you see the incidence beam, KI, and scattering beam, KF. And you record it at the detector. So this plane represents the detector, which is analogous to a small arc in the Evald sphere formation. And it crosses the break point if you align your crystal to the break condition. And then by mechanically rotating uh, your sample by small steps with the angle delta theta, you can actually get these slices through the reciprocal space and uh, record the full three dimensional distribution of intensity around the break point. This is actually one of the fastest and easiest way to record break CDI data. And, and to see it more like intuitive way, this is animation, how it actually happens. So the x ray beam hits the sample. And when you do this nice tilting around the break condition, the reciprocal space travel through the, through the detector plane and you record each of these slices on your detector and you can work uh, with this data later on. Uh, sometimes these movements are making things complicated if you want to use some very stable environment or some special uh, devices on top of your sample and you don't want to move anything. So there is a way to record the same type of data set without actually moving anything on the sample side by changing the energy of the X-rays and keeping the focus on your sample. Uh, this way it's called uh, energy scan. So you can start from, uh, from uh, higher energies um, or from lower energies or, or higher energies. You can just scan a very narrow um, energy range of your incoming X-rays. And basically, by changing the length and the angle, this is exaggerated, you can also scan through the reciprocal space and get your three-dimensional data set. And this basically looks like that. So the, K, the lengths of the K vectors change and the resulting Q vector lengths also change. So you can map the whole 3D distribution of intensity through your detector again. However, the sampling issues or like working with the data is a bit more complicated, but it's a topic for a separate talk, I guess. Um, on the technical side, how do we access these uh, reflections in a reliable way? Well, so you can use uh, two options. One is uh, the diffractometers is a well-developed uh, instrumentation. A lot of companies produce it, where you have um, motors for both your sample and the detector, and you can get any orientation of, of them with respect to each other with a high precision and uh, reproducibility. And that's perfect for doing this type of experiments, though sometimes uh, there is a lack of flexibility because detector distance cannot be changed easily and then only customized version of this diffractometer can work. Um, as an example, this is how the actual diffractometer at P10 and Petra 3 signature looks like. Allows you to go anywhere in the full quadrant of the 3D space and access any reflection or orientation of your sample as you like. And of course, the good scatters, you need to precisely move uh, your sample. Another option is uh, to use the robot arms. This is the case of Nanomax at Max 4 here in Lund, uh, where the detector is mounted on the robot arm, computationally moving. So it's compu uh, computer uh, programmed to move uh, around the heaven sphere, around the sample, and keeping the same distance. So it's very nice and it gives much more flexibility in the measurements. Uh, what are the requirements for successful measurements? Uh, most important, of course, is the sampling, which was already discussed also in the forward direction. I'm just uh, briefly recap this. Uh, you record your signal by a pixelated detector, so you sample your uh, 
uh, continuous signal with the pixels and uh, we've successfully reconstruct something with the phase retrieval algorithms. We need to have this pixel uh, spacing smaller than inverse size of your object. So uh, you should get at least uh, three points per fringe so period, let's say, to uh, reconstruct uniquely the signal coming from the, uh, from the sample scattering signal. Of course, you need you would like to have much more to get a really nice reconstruction. And uh, this is called the oversampling criteria, and normally it should be a, more than two along the, each direction in your data. But uh, in the case of Brex CDI, you also have a third dimension. So how you sample the third dimension, because you actually record um, by doing rocking curves. So this is how the initial state uh, looks like for the first position along the rocking curve. The second one is basically a rotation of this triangle by some small angle delta theta. And you can see that the other sphere with an approximation of very small angles just moves along this, this coordinate delta q. And uh, this delta q is related to delta theta uh, almost directly with this uh, relation, which is again, uh, the delta theta should be proportional to inverse of uh, object size. So large object you have, smaller step in the Q-space should be and vice versa. Um, this number is just an order of magnitude of the angle uh, angular step for uh, an average experiment. So it's uh, hundreds of degrees. That's, that's precision you need for your scanning stage. Some small summary, uh, summary for these parts, basically to get the nice data, you need to find a microfocusing or nanofocusing beamline with a diffractometer setup. It can be four or six circle diffractometers. You can choose between uh, beam sizes uh, with a full coherence. Normally it's between 200 uh, to 1000 nanometer, but uh, with the advent of new sources, uh, this range can be extended. Use a flexible detector positioning and small pixel size to have a nice sampling. And you either do the uh, rocking curve scans, which are fast, uh, but it requires alignment of the sample into the center of rotation that you don't lose your sample out of the beam, uh, but it has low stability for certain um, environments of the sample. Or you choose the energy scans for improved stability when you basically change only the energy of the beam by tuning uh, the undulator and the monochromator but it requires more time and you need to work on the data resampling a bit more. Uh, some uh, limit requirements and limitations overall, only isolated objects can be reconstructed, uh, isolated both in real and reciprocal space. So you can actually catch a single break spot from your, from your sample. It can be in a powder type of preparation or just on a, alone on a, some substrate. You should be sure that it's isolated. You better know the orientation of your crystals so that you know where the reflection you are looking for. That can be uh, supported by some lower measurements or electron microscopy measurements. So you actually know how your sample is aligned with, the, with respect to the substrate. You need the material which scatters enough uh, photons. So like five, six orders of magnitude of dynamic range would be a perfect data to reconstruct, uh, lower it goes, um, it's more difficult. X-ray damage, obviously your sample should survive the beam. It should be, uh, your particles should be also mechanically st stable under the beam. When you put uh, a high flux beam onto your sample, like a nanoparticle, it, it can rotate basically under the beam pressure or other effects. And then you lose your diffraction pattern out of your out of your field of view and you have to search it again. So this is um, quite a bit of limitation of the technique sometimes. And you also have to ensure that sampling is adequate. After the data is collected, uh, the interesting uh, things just starting and that's basically an example of the workflow you can experience to actually get to the publishable results. So starting with the data acquisition, you go through the clearing of the data, the phase retrieval itself. So, uh, lots of corrections for different instabilities or partial coherence effects, coordinate transforms, and then you have to convert everything to the actual quantitative values. I'm not going to cover all of them, but uh, the most crucial one related to the 
break version of the CDI uh, I want to mention. So the phase retrieval was also described already. Let's look at an example of the gold standard of break CDI, which is basically a gold nanoparticle, which scatters a lot and has a nice shape. And you measure normally one on one reflection, which is normal to the surface. Use some initial guess with the random phases, and then you your goal through this uh, iterative process, substituting the scattering amplitudes, which look like that in a reciprocal space, and real constraints in a, in, a re uh, in a real space, which are the shape or positivity and so on. And I actually want to make a small remark, like how you can guess your shape of the object right away and knowing only the intensity, just a small hint. You know that uh, the intensity, the scattering intensity from the object is basically an uh, autocorrelation of uh, the wave field coming out of the object. So you can exploit this fact and actually calculate uh, the inverse Fourier transform of your measured intensity and then you get the object in the, which amplitude is twice larger in each dimension, but it's already a very good uh, approximation to the shape and size of your particle. So you can use this one as an initial guess and you will be very close in most of the cases. Uh, after the phase retrieval is done, uh, your uh, next problem is basically a coordinate transformation because you measure the data in the coordinate um, uh, system of your detector, which is not orthogonal. And to go back to orthogonal um, uh, space where you can align your object with the, Q, with the reciprocal lattice vectors of the crystal, you need to do this uh, transformation back to the laboratory frame, so-called. For that, you need to know the sample and detector angles. You need to know the exact distance between the sample and detector. And you need to know angular or energy step of the scan. So this is how it looks like uh, in the detector coordinate system. So basically, the object is skewed. Um, but uh, after resampling towards the lab coordinate system, it becomes orthogonal. And it's much easier to work with uh, because we work with matrices uh, in this technique. As an example, the, the gold nano particles normally look like that, very symmetric and nice shape, but in a skewed coordinate system, it looks something like that. This is a reconstruction of the data from before. But after the remapping towards the lab coordinate system, it becomes more symmetric and it actually looks like a gold nano particle we measure. And already here, you can notice one of the interesting effects we can reconstruct with back CDI. You see this gap between two parts of the crystal. It's nothing wrong with the crystal itself. It's still a full particle, but we miss this intensity in between just because it's not scattering to this break condition we measured. Uh, because there is a, a tuning defect. So basically the crystal orientation is different for this part of the crystal. And this is one of the sensitivities with break CDI you can achieve, which is not possible to see with electron microscopy, let's say. Um, another important aspect to correct after the reconstruction is done is uh, if your object is three-dimensional, you will get an additional phase shift, which is not, which is uh, nothing to do with uh, the phase structure of your sample. Actually, is the difference in the path lengths um, like, uh, of the scattered uh, beams. Let's say the X-ray beams coming under the, the break angle. But for different incidence uh, positions, you will get different uh, propagation distances of the X-rays inside your sample. And as a result, you will get an additional phase difference uh, as an outcome. And this is important to correct, and that can be easily done since you know the morphology of your object. You just have to take care of that and uh, compensate. Otherwise, the phase information will give a false information on the, on the strain or displacement fields. So after all the corrections, we have our nice uh, phase reconstruction. These are the central slices of the gold nanoparticle. And now we can go towards the quantitative uh, results. Uh, so basically, we can extract the displacement field from the phase, as it was explained before. And as we know, uh, the, from the elasticity theory, the strain or uh, the amount of relative dis the distortion of the crystal can be calculated as a gradient of the displacement field in the respective direction. 
And if you measure at least three non-collinear reflections from your crystal, you can reconstruct the full tensor uh, of, uh, of the strain inside. So in this case, uh, this is a displacement, how it looked like after the conversion. And since our reflection was one 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 pointed up upwards, we can calculate the gradient and then we get the strain values, which are pretty low sometimes. So we have a nice sensitivity down to 10 to the minus four. And this is very uh, important aspect of the Brex CDI that you can access actually very the subtle uh, changes in the strain within the three-dimensional object. So summary for this part, uh, obtaining quantitative data is uh, possible only if you try to learn as much as possible about your sample before you go to the beam time. It's still like not uh, giving you a direct answer to all the questions, but you will know where to look for these answers. You should know the orientation of your crystal. You should know your reference values if you want to get some absolute measurements like the exact lattice spacing. Uh, you have to correct for effects which affect the phase distribution after the reconstruction. And um, additionally, you should think about minimizing the numerical artifacts coming from the phase retrieval itself. Uh, some examples uh, on, uh, on successful applications uh, of these techniques. Uh, everything started with a very simple uh, objects. Uh, basically, the first works showing the feasibility of the approach were done by Ian Robinson, studying uh, isolated uh, gold nanocrystals, like in this case, this is a reconstruction of a gold nanocrystal. Uh, and the approaches were developed how to reconstruct and get this useful information out of the data. But it was not um, really like towards the real world applications. More recently, um, I published work on uh, single nano objects in the field of nanowires or nano, nano composites or different nanostructures artificially made when you can access the strain fields during the growth or some influences about the growth approaches. Uh, one uh, important uh, example is uh, that you can study defects and their dynamics in uh, real uh, materials or applied materials like battery cathode which is also uh, consists of nanoparticles. You can access how these locations inside the particle nucleate and uh, propagate during charge and discharge. So it's actually in a functioning device. Or you can study the full three-dimensional tensor of the simple objects, but under very harsh and um, extreme conditions like iron uh, irradiation happening in a nuclear reactor, for example. Uh, you also can go into the in-situ and operand imaging is a highlight of the technique that you can combine this simple broken curve measurement with advanced uh, sample environments and get access to the structure while the, some processes are happening. So this example, for example, is the, oxy the surface oxidation during the catalytic reaction of the palladium particles inside the dome. So all kinds of combinations can be done, and that's a very exciting and sometimes, of course, also challenging um, field. But uh, it's it's still in the development phase and very interesting to work in. Um, some words I want to say about the extension of this technique, uh, which I probably think will be covered later in this course uh, in this webinar series, is the combination of Brex CDI with tachography. So if you want to study the three-dimensional strain distribution inside the extended objects, you basically combine the Brex CDI approach with the scanning technique when you go with your focus beam through the extended object and collect the diffraction pattern from each position. I briefly want to mention what is the major differences to the Brex CDI. It's basically the dramatic increase in the measurement time, which can be hours depending on your sample and the amount of signal you can record. It's a dramatic increase in the data volumes. It's five dimensional data sets, uh, which can get gigabytes and gigabytes in sizes. Um, the stability issues start to play a major role because of the measurement times and then phasing issues of actual three dimensional objects can be challenging since you have to impose certain uh, constraints and it's not very easy uh, to do. Or you use the model-based approaches to uh, explain what actually is reconstructed uh, in your experiment. 
Um, now we're coming towards um, the end. So I want to mention the major facilities where this type of experiment can be done. Um, I would like to start with the APS where most of the uh, pioneering works uh, were done is uh, at 34 IDC beamline in USA. Um, advanced photon source synchrotron and Ross Hart and Monzok Chai is the contacts um, at this beamline if you want to uh, try something there. Then in Europe, we have a bunch of synchrotrons doing um, uh, this, uh, but I will mention just a few. Uh, the ESRF ID01 uh, at Petra 3, it's P10. Uh, uh, here at Max 4, we develop uh, this technique also at Nanomax and uh, at Diamond Light Source in UK. At I13, you can also do that. So overall summary about the BRAC CDI is that we can image uh, the isolated crystalline objects from 50 to 100, 1,000 nanometers, that's the big range. Uh, the sensitivity to any effects which induce electron density displacement or atomic displacements. Um, it's relatively easy to combine with advanced sample environments. And most important, then we can go to study better structures or do experiments in situ and operando. And the negative sides, uh, we get the radiation damage and mechanical stability issues. It's relatively narrow sample size to get uh, the maximum signal to noise ratio and get the best results. And there are limits on the strain actually we can reconstruct, so it cannot be actually normally more than 1% of the strain. And uh, sometimes the data analysis can be quite complex. Talking about the data analysis, so the software is still in development in many groups around uh, the world, uh, but I will mention those which are available online. So it's a Pinex developed at ESREF. It's a nice Python package which can do almost anything, and uh, there are nice uh, implementations of the high speed computation. Or the phaser uh, is a method implementation of the phase retrieval done by myself. And it's also important to have packages for the post-processing to actually analyze the data you reconstruct. Uh, it's a BCDI uh, project by Jerome Carnes, uh, and you can also use the post phaser, which is a part of the phaser uh, software by myself. With that, um, I hope uh, you learned something new today. Uh, we come to the hands-on uh, part. Um, I wonder how many people uh, managed to install something. But uh, I would like to just briefly show um, uh, how to work with the phases software, which was shared with you. Uh, if you can follow, that would be really nice. Uh, you just start the program the way you can do it, either by the, running the installation you have or from the MATLAB code. You should see the screen something like that. Here, uh, you can see the startup screen where you can specify some experimental parameters um, uh, which are related to your experiments. In this case, they are loaded from uh, as ini initial initialization file, or you can type them in manually, or you can just leave it as a standard values, which you see there. To load the data, you press the open file and you choose the data test, you press open, the data should be loaded and you can have a look uh, in this starting screen. So this is a reciprocal space window and a real space window. You can have a look and you, at your isosurfaces of the Bragg intensity. In this case, that was uh, some particle with nice fringes, so nicely scattering particle. And uh, following the approach we discussed in, in these webinars, uh, you need to create the initial guess. In this case, we can choose the autocorrelation option. So this is the support estimate, it's already chosen. And then you press the create object. So the object is created. And uh, right now it's nothing else than just the blob, which is has only a twice size of our actual object. And then you have tabs here, which are used for different steps of the data analysis. You go to the reconstruction tab and uh, inside this reconstruction tab, you have all these algorithms we discussed before 
in also some combinations and patterns to use, but we will work with very simple uh, approach, uh, changing error reduction and hybrid input-output algorithms. So let's start with this one. Uh, if you have CUDA on your laptop or computer, you can turn on the GPU acceleration here in the corner, and then it will go faster. And then you basically just run the HIO algorithm. If you have a MATLAB, you can see the update. So it basically goes very fast. The twin image forms here, but it eliminates at some point. So one of the solution is chosen. So this is already a quite good estimation of our object and you can finalize it with error reduction. Let's say 50 iterations. So here there are parameters which you can tune and play with and you will see that some of them work, some of them not. So you can actually um, play with all the algorithms and parameters. So this is the number of iterations to do. The feedback parameter is how much updates should be done. The sigma interval is the how much uh, the, uh, this is for the shrink wrap algorithm, which gets your uh, support on every step. Uh, so you can start from larger values. So it's smoothing your support lot, uh, more and then goes to the smaller one, or you can start from some smaller values if you already have a nice yes of the object. And uh, how many steps should be done for this uh, shrink wrap algorithm and the threshold. So basically you can keep these values standard. I chosen them because they give a nice result most of the cases. And then you run error reduction, which basically will finalize the reconstruction and give a nice shape. So this is the amplitude, so proportional to electron density, and this is the phase. Already here, you can see that there is a phase gradient. So these wraps of the phase, which are not physical and they can be fixed. So this is the, how the reconstruction looks like. You can go back to the three-dimensional view and compare reciprocal space and the real space. You can rotate and see the connection between the fringes and the facets of the object. And to remove the phase ramp, you just press these buttons. I think it's right or left, you just need two clicks and the phase ramp will be removed. That means the, the data was not centered in the calculation window. So right now there is no phase ramp and you can see a nice particle reconstructed with some missing intensity. It means the crystal quality was not that good, but this uh, slider basically allows you to change the iso surface. So you go through the iso surfaces of, intent, of amplitude of your object. So this is the basic steps you can do to reconstruct your Brex CDI data. If you specify a path here for saving, you can just press save results on the reconstruction window and then you get your results saved and you can work with them further. This is uh, just a short introduction to, for, for you to play with. For more details, you of course need to invest more time and with the real data, there are more challenges which actually has to be programmed and uh, yeah, I'm happy to help you with that or discuss if you want uh, after the webinar. But with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and are there any questions? All right. Um, we lost Edwin. Yes. Um, questions? All right. Uh, so while while everyone is still trying to think, it's uh, I think it's a uh, it's a lot of interesting information which we, we've downloaded within now uh, forty five minutes. Our our processing power is probably uh, still uh, <laughs> <laughs> still, <laughs> still trying to get updated. Um, so let me ask, uh, let's, let's get a little bit into some few uh, not so technical uh, details. What, what do you think um, 
could be done to improve the sensitivity of CDI, of BCDA. As you mentioned, you know, we, uh, we can only see some uh, percentage or fractions of, uh, of, of strain or displacement. What do you think uh, could be done from the um, experimental uh, part of it, from the uh, beam quality and also numerically to somehow improve uh, this resolution, uh, resolution and sensitivity rather? Yeah, uh, first and very kind of straightforward way to improve the sensitivity is to measure mm -hmm. higher order reflections from your crystal. Mm -hmm. But for most of the crystal, uh, further you go into the uh, Q values, you get problems with the intensity scattered. So mm -hmm. the crystals normally scatter less at the higher angles. And for some sizes of your object, you also can get into the dynamical uh, artifacts, um, dynamical diffraction problems but mainly for nano objects, it's not a, uh, not a big deal. Um, uh, so in this case, um, the development of the new synchrotron sources will definitely uh, lead us to this new field of uh, high energy break CDI. We can reuse uh, uh, higher energy uh, X-rays, like 50 kV or something, when we can easily access the higher um, reflections, uh, higher order reflections, but get the same amount of uh, scattering because the flux is improved and the coherence uh, also improved at these new sources. Uh, but if you think about your object, sometimes we measure like semiconductor materials, right? Yeah. And if you have an option to go to a higher reflection with the loss, uh, with the loss of some intensity, you should wait. Um, uh, you should find the balance between the amount of signal and the sensitivity you need. So you, you should choose a higher reflection to measure. And you also can go to, uh, I mean, with the larger beams, uh, you don't have much problems with the uh, divergence of the beam, but with the smaller, if you go to very small beams, you get this additional uncertainty in the strain just to the fact that K vector have some spread uh, at the focal point. So you rather use some low, low uh, focus beams for these type of approaches. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you also can prefer putting your detector as far as possible and filling in <laughs> the whole detector with it with very small mm -hmm. pixel size yeah. and you get more resolution there. Awesome, thank you. Um, um, questions uh, from the audience? I have one, if I may. All right. Yeah, uh, many people in the audience may not be really experienced with the technique of CDI. And mm. uh, one, one important thing is that the uh, particles are isolated. And then yes. you were mentioning the, uh, this uh, particle isolated in real space and in reciprocal space. Can you explain a little bit more how you can actually even illuminate many particles and still isolate them? Yeah. The important part mm -hmm. of sample preparation. That's a good question. This is one of the strengths of this uh, approach, which we can sometimes exploit, that many materials um, appear in the form of a polycrystalline or multigrain um, collection of the nanoparticles. Uh, for example, cathode materials in the batteries, or it can be, uh, I don't know, metals or some uh, polycrystalline thin films, like in solar cells. And there, all the crystallites has, have a slightly different orientation in the real space. So the crystalline planes, they all randomly oriented. And that gives us the opportunity to shine with a big beam, relatively big beam on some area of this sample and just select one direction in the reciprocal space. So we put detector at one position and we basically search on only those particles which scatter into this angle and we can see that the, the diffraction spot is basically coming from a single particle inside the bunch of the particles. And it can be representative because there is no uh, mechanical or structural difference. The only difference is that this particular particle is scattering to the direction we selected. And we can study that. So this is the isolation in the real space. And it, uh, you don't need big angles. It can be just a slight misalignment because further you go with the detector, you your angles basically uh, increase, there is a divergence, um, and you can select one or another reflection and 
you can uh, go with that. Thank you. Or you think about your sample preparation upfront, that you prepare your sample in a way that it's either isolated on a substrate or you cut out the piece of the material you're interested in and you manually put it with a Thebes, uh, focus ion beam techniques or some manipulation so you artificially create a Brex CDI sample. But this is more complicated and it's worth it if you actually want to see in the inside the structure or some buried uh, features inside your sample and you can extract them. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, thanks a lot, um, uh, Dina. Uh, uh, Dima, let me ask you, uh, uh, let's continue with the discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's, your, what's your general opinion on the, so let's go down a little bit to the reconstruction algorithms. I mean, there are a couple of, uh, you know, HIO, ER and uh, stuff like that. And uh, almost every group, almost every uh, principal investigator and uh, uh, researcher, we, uh, for someone would take a given data set from gold, would go with different choices of algorithm, ER versus HIO, would get a solution, which is publishable. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the next person would do something with um, some relaxation and ER and it's publishable. Um, what do you think, uh, is there a way that as a community we could um, try to understand uh, which uh, the, the range of sensitivity and uh, of every algorithm when it has to do with, with phase variation and, mm -hmm. uh, and uniformity of uh, of the uh, of the electron density and uh, so basically, can you say a little bit about uh, when some algorithms would fail and uh, which ones would work a little bit better on the situations of either density fluctuations or or phase or not phase shift but uh, you know constraints on uh, on phases things like that. So, which particular algorithms you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like so, so, so. Yeah, mm. so, yeah. So let's say I have a crystal that has um, dislocations, you know, and uh, uh, across these dislocations, the, the, mani the manifestation in the wavefront would be, you know, phase jumps. So you're going to have uh, regions in which the phase is going to vary rapid. Uh, it's going to either rapidly vary between mm -hmm. uh, plus or minus pi over two, and then the densities also would not be smooth. Uh, what? And then you automatically go to another uh, algorithm to sort of help in this problem. Is there some, is there some um, guided approach that uh, new users in the community should be aware of uh, uh, when doing the reconstruction? If, if you have priority information about your crystal, you knew that you were mm. doing indentation and it is highly mm. strained, what yeah. guidance would they have in mm. choosing algorithms to, to continue? It? Yeah. This is a good point, uh, and uh, I would say that we, as a community, at some point, we have to arrive to a, some kind of, not machine learning, but, you know, uh, the approach which basically can minimize um, these distances or these error functions for whatever object just based on the fact we know that, okay, these type of features in the diffraction pattern form these type of objects, and we get closer uh, to, to the actual solution. But in terms of algorithms or rather approaches, as you said, if you know something about your object, which is more complicated than a gold nanoparticle with a single dislocation or something like this, yeah. <clears throat> you have to feed in all this information into your algorithms. This is the first. So the, the, if you know the shape as precise as possible, you have to basically put it as a constraint. If you know roughly the the number of dislocations or, you know, some parameters like porosity or some parameters like uh, the strain variations which you expect, which are like, you know, at least possible, that will definitely improve the reconstruction in the end. Yeah. And on top of that, uh, the approaches like uh, guided or these uh, gen genetic algorithms allows you to reconstruct, like I have even a slide for this, like if you can create a big amount of random guesses or initializations, which can go through this genetic algorithm approach when you select the best candidates based on several metrics. It can be uh, just a normal reciprocal space error, which we minimize between the data and the object. It can be log likelihood uh, thing, which takes into account also the noise and the uh, 
it can take into account that, you, that your electron density can should be smooth. So these kind of things um, can be forced. And then it selects the best candidates that combine with the new guesses and then go, goes around and around. You can go through several generation of mutations of these reconstructions and you then you get the best candidate in the end. So this kind of approach is not just uh, averaging, you know, but just by choosing the best candidates for, for this particular problem could be uh, the approach. But I, I think uh, that's, a, that's a really a big problem, like why you choose this algorithm or mm -hmm. not another. Uh, yeah. Right now, like at least when I began, it was more than, it was more like an art. You just sit and try to guess what is, what is the best. But by using several criteria nowadays, I think you have to choose the best. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, do we have uh, one final question or two more? We, I think we still have some some time for questions. Um, all right. So let me ask uh, one, uh, probably one more. Um, so just what do you think? Uh, how? What's your perception of the uh, the future of uh, of uh, BCDI? I mean, where do you think we are heading? And in the global scheme of things, we We've seen papers that has reported five nanometer spatial resolution reconstruction, and we've seen uh, applications of BCDI to image train and uh, elastic and ferroelectric domains and different mm. uh, types of scenario. Um, but uh, from your experience and, and where do you think we're going to sit in this uh, synchrotron community within the next uh, 10, 20 years, especially with the emergence of X fields? And what do you think would be the uh, the direction in which the BCDA community should be moving towards? Would it be pushing resolution uh, to better than five nanometer? Is that what we should be, be thinking of? Or we should be trying to move towards the scenario of having a black box, you know, like uh, like electron microscopy, which is, uh, yeah. you give me a sample, I, I, tell, I tell you with uh, high fidelity, you know, how, how it looks like. And what do you think, what's your, what's your feeling? Yeah, I guess there are two basically uh, parts to this question. As you said, the black box, it's of course mm -hmm. our aim mm -hmm. um, for next years, especially with the new sources to develop this black box finally. You know, mm -hmm. that's uh, a lot of people who don't want to, you know, code and understand this data analysis from the beginning because it takes so much time to get into the, all the details. Um, that you actually bring your sample and reconstruct. And that can be done with the use of um, uh, not only the iterative uh, algorithm, but also machine learning and this kind of thing when the reconstruction can be done in in a second regime, not like in the minutes or that it can be basically taught, but it gets with experience and uh, amount of data we measure. So yeah, I think this is the way that we create a microscope at some point because all, most of the things in this technique can be uh, automa uh, automatized. And that's done at different beam lines to the different extent, like realigning the particles, the measurement itself can be fully automatic. Like, especially if you know the reflections you are looking for, you just type in all the matrices for the coordinate transforms, and then it goes and measures this. This is one of the ways to go, of course. <clears throat> on a technique side by itself, I think we should really focus on actual uh, useful information, which can be obtained from the materials under uh, their either native or functional uh, uh, state inside the devices or under some uh, uh, processes which you actually want to study because all these proof of principle experiments more or less were done and we still struggle with some type of reconstruction we cannot do, but I think it should go that way. Plus the time resolution is uh, one of the things which is important to develop that we can actually see how these structures evolve during the experiment and can we control, can we see the difference between this sample or that sample prepared in a different way, but measured with the same technique. And in general, I think as a last step, I actually showed in this work that the statistical analysis would be in the end the major part of work for the scientists that you get 
a lot of statistic from single beam time because you can do fast measurements and you can analyze fast. And then you do not struggle with deciding, oh, is this particle looks like a real particle or not? You analyze actually the effect you wanted to see. Yeah. I think we should be heading this way that we actually grab the quantitative information out of it and analyze that. That, that would be the focus. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dima. Thanks. Um, okay. Dina, do you want to say a few things for us to, uh, to take it away? Uh, yes, well, yeah. obviously, thanks uh, to Dimitri and Edwin for sharing this session. Uh, we are uh, basically giving you appointment for next two uh, dates. We have already one date next week, and it's Edwin himself is going to present some uh, specific and fancy application of CDI in Prague. And actually, the week later, um, we have a, a, a new speaker. It's not yet uh, public on the page, but it will be soon. And it's Alexander Bierling from Nanomax and Max4, who is going to present actually how to fight uh, the rotation of the uh, particles in the beam. So uh, Dimitri, as uh, finally, <laughs> and then uh, Alex, it's just very timely. Alex will tell us about this, and then later on. Uh, Dimitri also today spoke about uh, uh, using scanning approaches with Bragg, and this is Tychography in Bragg, and we are actually very lucky to have uh, two of uh, the pioneers in this technique, Virginie Chamar from um, CNRS in France, and uh, Stefan Draskiewicz who has also uh, agreed to participate today. So I'm very happy for that. I'm looking forward to the next uh, talks. And I keep you, uh, I, I ask everyone just to keep uh, looking at the webpage of links because new uh, seminars will come along. We will also actually, uh, based on a request from one of you, um, uh, I've also invited somebody who has done tychography on biologic samples. Uh, so it's important that if you give us your feedback, we can actually respond better to your request and to your need. So with, we, with this, I thank everyone. Thank uh, Dimitri, thank Edwin and uh, see you next time.